So we have the Bayesian approach that says that any uncertainty can be quantified or can and should be quantified and whatever it is that you do not know you could assign probabilities to. And uh, this got a very important support from the work of Leonard Savage in the 1950s. Uh, Savage had probably in mind certain limited state spaces or spaces over which you have to assign probabilities. But the evolution of economic theory was such that it started to apply to everything and anything. Um, John Alsani, who won a Nobel Prize in '94 for his contribution to game theory, um, helped economics deal with situations where we don't know what the utilities are. And um, it's a little bit surprising, even for me, uh, that I'm, I've been around for 30 years, I didn't understand what the contribution was, but apparently this was a breakthrough that uh, waited for him and basically said well if you don't know what the utilities are we should think about it as a, a problem under uncertainty imagine you go back before you're born and then you don't know whether you're going to be born into this type or that type into those, these types and then it's just a problem under uncertainty we're just going to go back when you're still in the womb and before you're born and then assign probabilities to that and apply the Bayesian approach there and then what we now call Nash equilibrium has become the Bayesian Nash equilibrium because you're doing Nash equilibrium, namely reacting optimally to what the others are doing, but before you know even who you're going to be born into. Um, and this, you know, by Bob Auman, we we'll push this even further by putting even more things into the state space. So the state describes everything that could possibly have happened in the past and the knowledge partitions, what everyone knows, what everyone knows that everyone knows, etc., etc. And at some point, the Bayesian approach is being applied to a state space that is so large and so informative that you ask yourself, how on earth would I be able to assign probabilities to that? Now, David Schmeidler, who used to be my advisor and colleague for many years and a good friend, started in the early 80s criticizing, uh, criticizing this approach. Um, he actually started with an example where he said, talk to his friends in the stats department and say, suppose that um, I'm offering you to bet on a coin. And the coin can be one that I pull out of my pocket, uh, which you've never seen. Or the coin could be pulled out of your pocket, which you played around with and you tested. And you know that your coin is fair and is about 50-50. And about my coin, you know nothing. Now, knowing nothing, if you have to assign probabilities to it because you're committed to be Bayesian, you'll say 50-50 out of symmetry, probably, something like Laplace principle of insufficient reason. But doesn't it feel different having the 50-50 that is based on statistics and the 50-50 that you arrived at by shrugging your shoulders? Uh, it turned out that this is basically the experiments that uh, Daniel Ellsberg suggested, not really conducted, but sort of uh, thought experiments that Ellsberg did in 1961. He published this paper and uh, he was talking about, uh, say, two urns, one urn in which you know that there are 50 balls that are red and 50 that are black. Another one, you have 100 balls. Each of them is black or red, but you don't know what the composition is. Same kind of story. You pull the ball out of here. Um, if you have to assign probabilities, you want to satisfy symmetry because if no better reason, then you'll have to do 50-50. Uh, but many people, when asked, say that they would rather bet on either black or red from the known urn with known 50% probability to either of black or red from the unknown urn, but there's no probability that can justify that. Because if you assign probabilities to the unknown urn, one of them would have to be at least 50%. So what David Schmeidler did was to suggest a more general theory having to do with the notion of probability that is not necessarily additive. So intuitively speaking, if you think about the probability of red or black, maybe both of them are less than a half, but the probability of the union is one. And how could that happen? Well, not if you think about an empirical frequencies, but if you think about your probability or subjective probability as your willingness to bet, then this seems to be describing your willingness to bet if you prefer the known probabilities to the unknown probabilities. So there was a question of how do you make decisions with respect to that. The standard approach is expected utility theory, which means you take an integral of a utility function based on the probability measure. We know how to do that. How do you do it in the context of non-additive ones? 
What David Schmeidler did was to use the notion of Choquet integration that Gustave Choquet suggested in 53 and 4 um, in the context of physics of electrical charges and so on, uh, and to provide the axiomatic foundations for that. Uh, he and his followers, including myself, provided uh, axiomatic foundations similar to the work of Savage or Anscombe Aumann in the context of the classical theory for the case where you might not have uh, probabilities that add up. The probability of the union might not be the, the sum of probabilities. This was related to another work that David and I did together, which has to do with uh, more than one probability, or say, multiple priors. It's called a prior because all of this is before you get information. After you get information, it will be a posterior, but we're going back to the prior. And there uh, we looked at a model in which you say, okay, maybe instead of having one probability, you have a set of probabilities because that's sort of the classical, or the, the standard situation in classical statistics. Classical statistics is about having a set of distributions and not trying to quantify which one it is. As opposed to Bayesian statistics that has probabilities over probabilities, classical statistics, you have a, a set of probabilities and that's it. And all the confidence intervals, hypothesis testing we're doing is in this tradition, a set of distributions without trying to quantify over them. Um, and in our model there are again axiomatic foundations, namely what kind of behavior uh, or what kind of consistency of behavior would you see that would be equivalent to, now in our case what you do is you have a utility function that is not given to you but if you satisfy these axioms then it is as if there exists a utility function. There exists in this case not a single probability measure, but a set of probabilities. Now, how do you make decisions? So for every probability, I do have an expected utility for a given option. In our model, what comes out is that you look at the minimum. So it's called max mean expected utility in the sense that for every option, I compute all the possible expected utilities, all the possible expected utility values when I range over the probabilities, and I take the minimal one. And that's what I'm trying to maximize. Uh, and then there are many other models that have been developed since. Uh, I won't try to describe all of them here, but there was definitely more than one model. Um, these things have been applied to a variety of phenomena that are relatively harder to explain with the Bayesian paradigm, um, including you know, macro phenomena, fin finance phenomena. Just one example that's very close to the original Ellsberg experiment is what's called in finance the, um, the home bias, which is the phenomenon that when you look at how people trade, they seem to prefer to be trading on um, equities of their domestic equities of their home country as compared to foreign ones. And you might stop and ask why, because according to finance theory, the price already incorporates all the information, so it should have the same probability of going up and down, otherwise people would buy or sell. So if you think that it's going to go up and down with the same probability of 50-50, then what's the difference between the 50-50 of your home country and the 50-50 of a foreign country? But then a couple of people suggested maybe that's exactly the kind of Ellsberg phenomenon, namely the foreign one is like the unknown urn, if you really insist on, say, 50-50 up or down, just because of symmetry, my ignorance is symmetric, but it's not that I really know. Whereas when it comes to my home country and I know more about it, I know more about the firm, I know, I read newspapers about it, etc., maybe I feel that I know more about why it's really 50-50. But this is just one example. There are many examples and many um, theories in macroeconomics and in labor economics and other things that can be uh, better explained using these kind of models. Um, which models should you choose when there are many models that deal with this? By the way, the phenomenon is also called um, ambiguity, in the absence of probabilities, and, or Knightian uncertainty, because Frank Knight talked about it in the 1920s. Ellsberg called it ambiguity, so the common assumption is that people don't like ambiguity, so it's called Knightian uncertainty aversion or ambiguity aversion. Experiments sometimes find that people do like it, but most often people tend to believe that, um, I mean researchers tend to believe that people prefer to know probabilities than not. Um, but there are many such models and people sometimes ask which one should you use. Um, typically I'd say we don't know. None of our models is correct. We know this. I walk into a class in economics and I tell students, let's agree first of all, all the theories are wrong and all the models are wrong and now let's get started. 
So the question is not if the theory is correct, we know it's false. The question is, is it false in a way that invalidates the conclusions? Is it false in a way that is really important? So when you start dealing with uncertainty, I think the Bayesian model is and should remain the benchmark. This is where you start analyzing a problem. But if you see that things cancel out, some expectation of x, expectation of minus x are canceling out, that's a time where you should say, wait, wait a minute. I'm becoming a little bit suspicious. If the qualitative result that I get depends on this canceling out, then maybe I want to see what happens with a model where it doesn't cancel out. Maybe I'm missing something which is qualitatively important. And then it might not be that important which model you use, because what you're basically doing is trying to see how robust the conclusion is. So if I have this cup of tea here and I want to see whether it's stable, I can try to push it a little bit from the right, or a little bit from the left, to try to test whether it's stable. Probably not so important whether I'm pushing it from the right or from the left. That's the same way we play with, with models. There is some qualitative result. We hope it tells us, some, tells us something about, about the world. Before we go on and really trust it, we'd like to test how robust it is, and then we can use this or the other model of ambiguity or uncertainty to see whether the, the qualitative conclusion that we arrived at in the Bayesian model is really stable, solid, robust or not.